on Larry King now, Kathy Griffin. I don't want to be a person anymore. I don't know if you know this, but being a person is very three years ago. I'm a brand now. On the state of women in comedy. Sexism in stand-up comedy is alive and well. And there isn't really a, a girls comedy club. I wish I could say there was. I'm a hardcore feminist. Like, I'm kind of in a club of one. And Bill Cosby. It makes me almost lose faith in human nature that this whole time he was not just someone who had, you know, one case or or was wrongly accused over and over. The idea that the biggest star on television would be a serial rapist, it's astounding. Kathy's take on the election. I'm very um, excited by the Trump run for presidency because it's comedy gold. It would basically be like um, electing President Gary Busey. <laughs> Plus, this is called motor boating. So, what like that? There, there. You just motor boating. Uh, yeah, you just motor boated me. All next on Larry King now. <laughs> Welcome to Larry King now. Our special guest. Kathy Griffin, one of my all-time favorite guests, the Emmy and Grammy Award-winning New York two, Times. It's two Emmys. Uh, all right, it's well, two Grammy, Emmys. It could, okay, it could be Grammy. Typical. I, this is so typical. Go ahead. She's a best-selling, uh, a New York Times author. She's number two, one, number one New York Times bestseller. Comedian, list. writer, actor, and activist. Her latest tour, called Like a Boss, is currently on an 80-city journey across the country. Is that journey in L.A. now? It's going to be at the Mark Taper Forum, four nights, November 4, 5, 6, and 7. It's beautiful, 750 seats. It's like being in my living room. Why do you call it like a boss, this tour? Because I have been touring for so many years that I really needed to name this tour so that if you came to see me 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, I want you to know this material is all new. A week after my four nights at the Mark Taper in Los Angeles, I'm going to be at a place called Carnegie Hall. Ever hear of it? How many nights there? One night at Carnegie, and I'm one of only five female comedians to play Carnegie by herself. How about that? Including the late Joan Rivers. Including the late Joan Rivers, Lily Tomlin, Whoopi Goldberg, Kathy Griffin. And I also am going to, um, the night after Carnegie, see, this is who I really am, Larry. This is the, the Kathy Griffin that you know. And I will be speaking about myself in the third person sometimes. Um, the night after Carnegie Hall, I'm going to be at the Horseshoe Casino in Elizabeth, Indiana. What a tour. I'm keeping this, it real. Now, is that a come down or a come up? That's weird. It pays more than Carnegie, baby. So really? you tell me. Do you remember the whole tour? Yeah. Do you get a percentage of the house or a fee? How does it work when you I do what's called two-walling. So I get a guarantee, and then if I go over a certain amount of ticket sales, I get a little back end. I see. Yeah. It's the same act in each city, right? No, that's the whole thing. It actually changes. In fact, when I do my four consecutive nights at the Mark Taper, I want to do something a little different every night. When I did my Broadway show at the Belasco, I did 10 shows in eight days, and it was really fun making, you know, at least like 15 minutes different every show. And I don't have an opener. It's an evening with. It's just two hours of me spouting off about everything from Donald Trump's tweets to my run-in with Gwyneth Paltrow two weeks ago to going backstage the Bette Midler concert to which celebrities want to kill me this week. I'm not saying Oprah wants to do me harm. I'm just saying she's not a fan. Uh, is it a bare stage? You just come out cold? Yeah, it's me, and um, I actually have an old-timey notebook that has bullet points, and it's all improvisational. I don't know what I'm going to say, and neither does the audience. Well, Ryan some... Seacrest, your boyfriend, Ryan Seacrest, who, by the way, made me late for this interview, so it's his fault. I know you think he's so wonderful, but he's evil. And he made me late for this interview. How did he make you late? Because, I don't know, he was, he was talking about his money. He was counting his money. He was actually just counting. Yeah, and I had to watch him just count his money. That's all he does. That's all he does. He says, let's go in the bathroom. I think it's for, you know, a blowjob. And instead, <laughs> meaning he's got to blow me. And instead, I, you know, he just counts his money. By any metric, you are you're one of the great comedians ever. Yet you have not made the list top ten earning comics. Right. They're all men. Yes. Does that bug you? It drives me crazy. Sexism in stand-up comedy is alive and well. I mean, last weekend I was honored and thrilled to participate and be one of the presenters to the great Eddie Murphy for the Mark Twain Prize. I was the only chick comic. After all these years, I'm going to start something called the It, Get Worse, it Gets Worse campaign by Kathy Griffin. <laughs> but a selfish side might say, you know, it's not bad. I'm the only. 
It was fun, I have to say. Hanging with the boys was really fun. And I had a great time with Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle and... Chris I, Rock is going to MC the Academy Awards. I know, he'll be fantastic. He did it once before. I love Chris Rock. And, um, you know, I'm just saying, I'm 54 years old, I'm doing 80 cities. Chris Rock actually asked me uh, if I owed child support. Because he said, 80 cities, what are you thinking? And I said, I don't know, I might be insane, but I love it. What do you make of Bradley Cooper's recent statement that he will share his salary with female co-stars so that they can negotiate better? He should. Why not? It's all about the transparency. And, you know, it's no secret. I mean, look, I love doing talk shows and, you know, whatever this is. And um, yet the fact is, if you look at your, you know, television guide or DVR or whatever, I mean, the guys have it locked down. They have it locked down. And um, it hasn't been since 1988 that the great Joan Rivers, was. she was the last female to have a network nightly late night talk show. Right. So she broke the glass ceiling and then somehow the glass got put back together again. So, so. I guess you and Sarah Silverman... I mean, Chelsea now, was on cable, but which is amazing. But you know, it's still different than network. And the guys have it all locked up, and they're all great, funny guys. But you, you know, a, nobody you represents a, me. What do you make of Amy Schumer? I think she's great. I thought her special was great, and I think she's genuinely funny. And you know, but there's still so few of us. There's like, you know, I'm 54, and then Chelsea and Sarah, I think, are like 40, something like that. And then you kind of how old is Amy? Amy's 32, I think, 33. And then, you know, you've got Lena Dunham, who's like 26, something like that. So I'm just saying there's sort of these big, you know, these sort of big spaces in between yeah. the tiers. You ever wonder about... And Lena. there isn't really a, a girls' comedy club. I wish I could say there was. I'm a hardcore feminist. But let me tell you, after spending the weekend at the Eddie Murphy... Um, prize you know those guys like stick together and they support each other and i can't honestly say like there's not like a whole bunch of other like 54 year old comedy chicks that are doing 80 cities that have two emmys and a grammy and we all support each other like i'm kind of in a club of one and so it's good you get to call the shots but i would love the opportunity in the future to have the support of a lorne michaels big fancy producer or some big fancy network saying here we'll help you give you the tools to well, do sure. what the guys can up next Kathy Griffin will discuss the state of comedy without Joan Rivers and Bill Cosby's gone too after this. We're back. You have discussed, oh, by the way, you miss what? Joan? Of course I miss her. I miss her every day. She was my pal and we would have dinner and talk shop and talk life and of course there was, there was only one. All right, let's get to the uh, Mark Twain Prize. Mm -hmm. I hear that Eddie Murphy did a thing on Bill Cosby. It was magical. All right, he so... He imitated him? Yes. What did he do? You know, Eddie's kind of a unicorn. I have a joke that he's, you know, uh, about as accessible as a prince. And, you know, he's not like the guy that, like, goes out to parties a lot and stuff. And so I wanted to get to know him a little bit better. Um, I stormed his room in my PJs. You know, makes me very human. And he said to me, you seem kind of like one of those eccentric people. I said, that's, that's correct. So by the time it got to the ceremony, we all knew each other pretty well, but there was a genuine nervousness on the, on the behalf of the producers, and all of us were backstage. I was backstage with Tracy Morgan and Rock and Joe Piscopo and, you know, all these great comics and, uh, you know, Chappelle, of course, is so funny. And we were all kind of wondering. We didn't know until the moment Eddie hit the stage what he was going to do because you know he famously went on Saturday Night Live and I think he did something like 43 seconds yeah. so the producers were saying we want more than 43 seconds we don't know what he's going to do so there was this big 15 minute downtime and everybody I mean all the comics we were all like kids we were just watching the stage like this like what's he going to do what's he going to say and he came out and he started out a little bit mellow talking about the Mark Twain prize and then he casually throws away didn't y'all give Bill Cosby one of these? And I mean, you could hear a pin drop, right? And then he just starts ramping up and it was hilarious. It was subversive. It was funny. It hit all the points that only Eddie Murphy could hit. And then, you know, afterwards I said, are, are you nervous about getting a call from Bill Cosby? He said, no. 
I mean, come on. He's, he's made of money. Yeah. Did I he mean, do it as Cosby? Oh, yeah, he did it as Cosby. And he addressed all the issues of the accusers. And he somehow made it funny, but real, but touching, but hilarious. And also, you know, he hasn't done stand up in 27 years. So he truly was a historic moment. And we were all backstage. I am not even kidding. We were like throwing our arms around each other because you want to see someone like Eddie Murphy, who, of course, I love his films, but I really love him as a stand up like the most and you want to see him stand there and own that stage by himself and just l fearlessly let it fly on a topic that can be obviously very very sensitive what do you make of the murphy career he doesn't do a lot of movies no nope. doesn't do stand up right what do you make of that? i think he's a guy that goes you know he's very clear about saying all right i did stand up i did it to the best of my ability I mean, he didn't say he conquered it, but he did. You know, he really saved Saturday Night Live at a time when they were struggling. He then started, you know, he created Beverly Hills Cop and Axel Foley and then Nutty Professor. And he made a point out of not just remaking the Jerry Lewis classic, but saying, I'm going to play every character. And I think he's a strategic guy who says, I'm going to make moves that no other African-American movie star has done. And Shrek, of course, global billion dollar franchise. He did four of those films. Um, I actually have two lines in the last one, so my presentation was about I'm that. I'm in the second, third, and fourth. I know, you're in all of them. You carried that franchise. <laughs> I hope Jeffrey Katzenberg sends you a big muffin basket. He hired me. You're darn right he did, because he's smart. What do you think Murphy will do next? Well, you know, there's a thing about stand-up, which is that you get bitten by the bug. So um, I don't know if he'll do stand-up again, but let me tell you, he killed. And uh, when they leave it in, and I believe they're gonna leave it in if PBS is smart, I think they are, then I think it's gonna make people want more. So look, he's in a position where, you know, the guy's sitting in his mansion, he's, you know, got a great life, he's still obviously hilariously funny, and that is no small feat. You know, he's my age, he's 54. So what's cool is he's a guy that you might think he's done it all, and then you see him get up and take that stage and go, and he still has it. And there's nothing better than looking at somebody that you go, they still have it. What's your read on Bill Cosby? Well, he seems like a serial rapist to me. But how do you, how do you fathom it in your mind? It's never been Why done in the history of show business. I mean, obviously there have been cases going back to Fatty Arbuckle where a celebrity has been caught or allegedly been caught or whatever, but when you think about a comedian that I worshipped as a child and I had the records and I knew the bit about the tongue sticking to the freezer and I knew all the Noah. bits by heart, and they were great. And then he went on to be an I spy. And then he went on to such great success. And then as he got older, got very high and mighty about doing the lectures about where the state of African-American men should be, et cetera. It is staggering. And it makes me almost lose faith in human nature that this whole time, he was not just someone who had, you know, one case or, or was wrongly accused over and over or somehow taken down by systematically women that had something to gain from it. I mean, the idea that the biggest star on television would be a serial rapist. It's astounding because, once again, it just makes you go, my gosh, this, this guy could have had any woman anyway, but there must be something in his psyche that wanted to give them actual rohypnol, and then the collusion and covering, and it took all these years, and that New York cover magazine was obviously very... Still in denial. Yeah, still in denial. Our yeah. guest is the great Kathy Griffin. Fearless, She's making on, enemies left and right. On tour with Like a Boss and the weekend of November 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, she'll be at the Mark Taper Forum here in Los Angeles. We'll discuss some of Kathy's previous provocative appearances on this program. What? And we'll get Me? her and we'll get her take on Donald Trump and Bernie. Perfect. Bernie's become a one-name person. I know. Like Cher. He's this. like Cher. We'll be right back. <laughs> Like a Boss Tour is underway. Our guest is Kathy Griffin. This is your third time on this show, many times with us on CNN. Yeah. Third time in three years. So I want to show you a clip from your last two Go appearances. Ahead. Watch. Go ahead. You're, You're not worried about what's going to happen at this table. I have no idea and don't care. Okay, well, because guess what? I try no. No, you're getting a lap dance right now. Oh, that's thrilling. Oh, this is the highlight of my year. There. But the year just began. And Thank I'm you. not wearing underwear. <laughs> All right. The title is your title? Of course. Yes. And that's you. Is that you? It's all of me. That's it's all of you. me, Larry. That's not you. What are you talking about? Tyler Shields took the photo. Are you doubting my butt crack? 
That is no. my butt crack. Do you okay. want to see it now? I'll no, show right no, now. sit down. Nope, I'll show you my butt crack right now. You're going to be sorry, Larry King. All right, we'll compare. Okay, ready? Got a problem, mister? No, I don't have a problem. Okay, fine. Don't doubt me. You think Joan would have done that? I hope so. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Kathy, why do you... Look at you, look at you. I know, but why... You're really a perfect um, target. Did I say target? I meant subject. Because in both of those clips, you really looked... You acted like you weren't thrown... Here, watch. Okay, now we're going to do something. This is called motorboating. So... We're going to wipe that. There. There. You just... Motorboating. Uh, yeah, you just motorboated me. Or I motorboated you. We motorboated each other. What? You got why? through it. You're alive. What made you do that, though? What kick do you get? Because at? I'm an Imagineer, like Walt Disney. I was imagining the few things I haven't done to you. <laughs> Let's get into politics. Is it true? Oh, you really recovered from that motorboat. <laughs> I mean, you really were not affected by that motorboat. No, but uh, your boyfriend, I'm jealous of him. He's going to come in here and kick your ass, King. You're going to be sorry. Well, he should kick yours. I didn't do anything. Oh, that is so typical. Blame the girl. <laughs> is it true you've been tweeting get my coffee bitch to Donald Trump every yes. day? Yes, yeah. I'm very um, excited by the Trump run for presidency because it's comedy gold. Now, as a woman, of course, I'm not happy about it. But as a comic, I'm in heaven. Because you realize that it's fun to watch him and his dog and pony show. But it would basically be like um, electing President Gary Busey. <laughs> so it would be fun. You know, would never a dull moment. But, you know, you can't, like send him anywhere. You understand, this is a global job. So, you know, he can be the president of, like, 5th and 67th, but he can't be the president of the United States. So if he were, yeah. what would you fear? Well, I fear that he doesn't know anything except for his incredibly narrow scope of whatever he learned at Wharton, which is what he mentions every seven minutes. I don't think Carl Akon should be in charge of China and Japan. <laughs> okay, I've never had that where, like, you just pick a billionaire and go, you're in charge of China and Japan. Like, it's putting him in charge of a kiosk at the mall. Uh, however, I do think that um, it's funny when he tweets back in a teenage girl fashion when he's so offended. And so once a week, I randomly tweet out to hear to him, whatever his handle is, um, please don't be president, but do what you should do, which is get my coffee, bitch. And he has not tweeted. He hasn't responded. I'm a, I'm a little upset. Well, maybe he'll bless you on the air one day. Hopefully. It's only going to boost ticket sales. What about Bernie Sanders? I'm feeling the burn. Um, you are. However, I'm hashtag ready for Hillary. It's our turn. We have an incredibly established, qualified female. People like to make history, and she's the one to make history with. And uh, the Benghazi hearings are a sham, and I actually wish the Democrats, including Adam Schiff, uh, would actually just boycott them. But um, I think the ideas that people have about Hillary are straight up false. And also it's unprecedented that there's an entire network called Fox News where it's just their mission to take down people. And I believe it's a network of propaganda. That's what I believe. And I've said that to Roger Ailes' face. Would Bill be part of the Hillary administration? I hope so, if she's smart. I think that Hillary needs to absolutely stick with Obama and not pull an Al Gore, who I love. But Al Gore was all about distancing himself from Clinton and Monica, like we cared. And guess what? We didn't care. He got impeached, and we still love him. Because it's called the economy, stupid. And so he, we had a balanced budget, which people don't remember. But I have a Rolodex and I'm going to use the word Rolodex because it's super modern. And also, um, Hillary's been around the world, and she knows all these heads of state, and she knows the game. And yes, she has had to move to the center a little more than I personally would like, but she has been put through hell. Remember when she was first lady, and then they tried to give her an actual job, health care reform, and people were like, what? The first lady just does gardens. And so she's really, really been put through the mill. She's testified before the Benghazi Committee more than Watergate. So um, I understand as a female comic in a male-dominated field, she's had to play the game and um, I think that she will be an astounding president but I do want her to stick with Obama because I think people like Obama more than they'll admit to like a Fox News poll. What can what would a campaign Hillary versus Trump be like? Well I think she would crush him because I think at the end of the day you can't just talk over somebody and that's his game. He, he just talks over people and he says the same thing and he has the ridiculous hat. 
Um, and I think she actually, yeah, he's very into his hat. He wants to make America great again. And by the way, we don't suck now. Like, I don't like his message that, like, we suck and everyone else is so much smarter than we are. No, actually, we're pretty great. So I think America is great. And here's how you think America isn't great. If you haven't lived anywhere else or visited anywhere else, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan. At this point, I'm more qualified to be president. So he hasn't even been to those places. Uh, So he should just zip it and get my coffee, bitch. I want some quick comments. Not you. Quick comments. I wasn't yelling at you. Some quick comments. Lost my temper. Some quick comments. Good luck. Just quick. Ben Carson. Uh, Keep your eyes open. Have you noticed? He talks with his eyes closed. He talks very slowly. But he does operations, you know, brain operations. Okay, but I would not go to him for carpal tunnel. I mean, I feel like he would just sort of fall asleep during (laughs) it. And, um, I mean, he's okay. Carly Fiorina. Uh, let's remember that when she ruined the lives of 30,000 Hewlett Packard workers overnight, she then took the $42 million parachute. She took the parachute, $42 million. Joe Biden. I'm glad he's not running because I truly feel that he and Hillary have the same base and I don't want them to cancel each other out. Jim Webb. He's already declared himself an independent. Jeb Bush. Well, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I think he should really just keep defending his brother's legacy. Kathy will take your questions in our final segment. Plus, we'll play a game of If You Only Knew. Her tour is like a boss. You'll find her in a city, guaranteed, based on what she <laughs> told us already. She'll be in a city near you, in Nome, Alaska, December 3rd. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back with Kathy Griffin. You and Anderson Cooper have a unique relationship. How do you explain yes. it? Yes. Well, he came out. Yes. You used to accuse him, and he never said anything, and now he came out, so... I dragged him out. No, um, he came out in his own time, and I was a big believer in that, because part of my activism with the LGBTQA2... QA2? Larry. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, intersex, ally, too. Anyway, um, (laughs) he came out in his own time, and I'm a big believer in that. So while I have canvassed and marched, et cetera, I still believe that the members of that community should come out in their own time, and God knows he did. And so, uh, yeah, we are going to do New Year's Eve again this year. And um, he has... How has that been now? It's going to be our eighth year. And so he, and I take pride in this, he gets more nervous with me than he does in a war zone. He said he sweats more. Well, because he doesn't know what you're going to do. And he shouldn't. He's not allowed to. Has CNN's uh, suits ever reprimanded you? Every year they fire me. They keep bringing you back because you must... I'm ratings gold. Against Ryan Seacrest on Well, NBC? first of all, no. Ryan has it all locked down with his whatever he whatever spell he and Oprah and Ellen DeGeneres have cast on the world. But no, Anderson and I offer a genuine alternative. We have a little dog and pony show. It's just us on the riser next to Telemundo, but we do try to amuse you. And it's very personal, and it's truly um, unpredictable. We have some social media questions. Darren Holmquist on Facebook. Kathy, are you and Cher still friends? Absolutely. How could you not be? She's a friend for life. Halu Hakim on Facebook. Why do you have such a large gay following? Do you feel it's like a social requirement or something? You well, first be of all, Halu Hakim, that's not even your real name. I'm going to say that's like a fake social media name. Do you have a large gay following? Yes, I do. It's been an organic uh, marriage. I was that girl that, you know, went to the Sadie Hawkins dance with the gay guy, and we had fun. And I actually officiated his wedding in Key West, Florida recently, and it doesn't get gayer than that. How can you officiate at a wedding? I did the online thing where I'm like a minister. Yes. You are a minister? Of course I am. (laughs) How can you ask that, you son of a bitch? I'm the most ministry. Screw Olstein. I'm the real deal. Thank God you're not a rabbi. (laughs) <laughs> Shalom. Everything Calb writes on our blog. If you could interview anyone living or dead, who would it be? Jimmy Carter. I love him. Okay. I like him too. But I know. But not Christ, not Lincoln, anyone living or dead? Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. Hitler. Look, the Carter interview would be a little softer than my Hitler interview. This one's from Barefoot Poet 107. He tweets, would you ever consider dating a five foot nine guy with long hair and a gray goatee? It sounds like someone, like a ZZ Top roadie, but sure. I'm, I'm what you call easy, Larry. But you have a boyfriend. Well, I know, but, you know, he's in the next room. Oh, shit. He's and right he, there. And he's No, young. I would never. He's a little, you know what, you know what Chris Rock said to me the other night? He had the nerve to say, I have never seen Kathy Griffin with a man old enough to buy her a drink. So, you know, there's a little age difference. How much older are you than your boyfriend? Well, if you're going to be a f- 
her about it. How, no, how much older? I feel like you're being a her. No, I'm not. I'm... All right, well, all right. First of all, you just motorboated me. Second of all, I'm 18 years older. Okay, that's nice. Where do you get off? Don't start with me with no, that no. category. You're okay. not going to win that game, let me tell you, my friend. All right, we're going to play a game if you only knew. Oh, who, okay, who was your childhood celebrity crush? Um, this is going to be weird, but I had a crush on Crispin Glover from Back Ooh. to the Future. He's like an eccentric type of a guy. Secret talent. My secret talent is that, um... Secret talent. Do you have a talent that you... No, nothing hmm. discernible. I just tell jokes. Uh, my secret talent is that I can, um... What can I do? Look at the boyfriend. He's like, nothing. Nothing. How about a great lay? Because last night you weren't complaining. God, these high school kids. Big Co mouth. Comedian we should be paying more attention to right now. Um... I mean, I, he, he gets all the attention in the world, but I am, like, in love with Cat Williams. Something you wish you were better at. Uh, diplomacy. <laughs> who, who would you like to trade places with for a day? Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, I don't know, like, uh, Stephen Colbert. Like, someone who has a situation where they have amazing, like, support and an environment where they can be... I mean, I think and Stephen is so great. Oh, my gosh, yes, it would be heaven. Best money you ever earned. Well, I mean, you know, uh, probably... What was your biggest paid date? Uh, like $240,000. One night? Yeah. Vegas? No, Atlanta. Atlanta, uh, yeah. a concert? Yeah. Wow. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right, finally, tell me something people don't know about you. I want to do a commercial campaign. I'm going to be on the cover of Ad Week for November, and I love that when I started, people were afraid of comedians for commercials, and I haven't done a commercial campaign in years, and I want to do a you'd funny like, one. What's a product? Anything, you'd... anything that has to do with travel. I travel all the time. Anything with energy. I obviously have a little too much energy. Anything with diet. I work out all the time. Anything with hair. I'm known to be a redhead. I mean, there's a million things I can push, but I just all want right. it to be a funny one. There you have it, advertising. Advertising agencies. That's and right. You'll be on Adweek's cover. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the cover girl. Why are you on Adweek if you don't do ads? They want to know why I'm not because no, they feel I'm a brand, and they said there's a brand, and I don't want to be a person anymore. I don't know if you know this, but being a person is very three years ago. I'm a brand now, and the cover of Adweek is going to say the Queen of L.A. and I'm dressed as Cleopatra. You're amazing. Well, I motorboated you. Thanks, thanks to my guest, the unapologetic <laughs> Kathy Griffin. To buy tickets to see Kathy live, to top that 280,000 figure, <laughs> go to kathygriffin.com. As always, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time. All right, I'm going to tweet you.